Hello, everybody. Can everyone hear me? Just give me a thumbs up if you can hear me. Yeah, Armin, can you hear me? I don't hear you, Armin. You're, Armin, you're, uh, Armin, you're, um, you're uh, muted. Armin, you're muted. You're muted. Hello, Armin? No, you're muted. Yeah. Hey, you're muted. Are you're muted? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you can't get it off. Let me talk to Gabe and see what's going on. Oh, oh. Okay, great. I'll talk, I'm gonna introduce you now, okay? Okay, hello everybody. Um, welcome to the Sauce Face Summer Institute of Art 2023, Cognitive Justice and the crisis in epistemology. Today, um, I'm very excited and it's with great pleasure that I'm going to introduce one of my very close friends and colleagues, uh, Armin Arvanasian, Avanasian, excuse me, who I met when I was teaching at Goldsmiths and he was in London doing a PhD, I believe, um, <clears throat> back in 2004. And, and since that time, we we have been uh, collaborating. Our, uh, Armand has been many times to the Sasfe Summer Institute of Art. He's one of the, the you know, like I guess the the center pillars, along with Franco Berardi, Yamulie Butang, a number of people, even Anuruddha uh, Anuruddha Vikram. Um, you know, just a number of people who, without them, this institution would never have happened. And when I think of ten years next year. It's just incredible. I hope Armin will come with us to Switzerland next year, but we'll talk about that. He lives in Switzerland, maybe he can do it. But anyway, here we go. So Armin Avanesian is professor of media theory at the Zeppelin University in Friedrichshafen, Germany. His English monographs include Irony and the Logic of Modernity, Present Tense of Poetics, and Metanoia, a Speculative Ontology of Language, Thinking, and the Brain both with Anka Henning, uh, both with Anna Henning, overwrite future metaphysics. Recently, he published One Plus One, Speculative Poetic von Feminism, Algorithmic, Politik and Kapital in English and German with Anka Henning, as well as Conflict van der Drinklichkeit, Die Problem von Morgen schon heute zu lassen in Berlin 2022. And uh, as we welcome here, let me say a few words about what he's going to do. He's gonna be talking from his new book. Uh, anyway, uh, entitled the lecture or talk today is entitled Living in Planetary Time, Hyper Anticipation and, and, and Biographical Big History. The notion of planetarity has in recent years gained currency as a means to address the new ways in which humans now interact with their host planet. Extractivism, climate change, human land use patterns constitute not merely ecological, but geological changes to the Earth system. They shortcut with and transform the planetary condition. At the same time, Earth spanning systems of data aggregation and computation enable scholars in the natural sciences and humanities to keep track of those changes in real time, They're put, thereby putting planetarity on our mental map in the first place. In this uh, presentation, uh, which by the way, he's finishing with another person who's spoken at SASFE named Daniel Fobb, uh, he will attempt a dual intervention into this emerging discourse. And very importantly, He's going to talk about the planetarity 
in an astrobiological context, which has not been really well understood and incredibly important, this idea of the astrobiological context. In doing so, it addresses a noticeable lack in the theoretical foundations and shifts focus from the spatial to a temporal understanding of planetary planets as continuously transforming entities. Second, it highlights the interplay of planetary and biographical time, which is as paradigmatic for our age of rapid technological and scientific acceleration as its ethical and political implications remain to be understood. Planetarity is not an object before us, but a force operated inside our lives as we construct our biographies. So it's great pleasure that I would like to uh, introduce and uh, uh, Amen Ambadasian. Thank you. Armin, are you able to double check your audio source? It's right next to the microphone on the bottom left of your screen. Armin, maybe you should leave and come on again and it'll, it'll reset itself by itself. Okay, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Yes, that's it. Okay, it was a different microphone. Thank Perfect. you. Perfect. 
Sorry, guys. Um, I... I start now, yeah? Is that correct? Okay. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's really a great pleasure um, to be here. I, I wasn't aware, I was wondering before like how many years, but now uh, I know that there's a big jubilee next year. And if it's really in Switzerland, then I, I, I consider myself invited. I really want to come. Um, it's, it's been some, some amazing, uh, thinking back at the, the intellectual trajectory and all the different topics that, that were topics of, of the, the summer school and yeah, uh, it's it's um, there will be books written about uh, this project in itself. So uh, having been in Sasfe, having been in Berlin, I just mention it again because indeed I once uh, did a co-presentation with Daniel Falb, um, and and even though Warren already mentioned it, I think it's it's uh, it's really important for me to to say that everything that I will present today is really um, uh, both our uh, our work. Um, uh, and the unclear things are probably mine. I'm, I'm not just um, saying this out of politeness. So it is a book uh, uh, um, that is in the making. making. I hope it's, it's soon finished. Um, and which had an initial idea or, or um, observation, namely that we're entering something like a planetary condition, um, a paradigm or roughly um, um, but that, that goes together with a kind of like confusion, namely that we do not really know what a planet is, by which I do, don't mean simply um, uh, that we can't distinguish them from stars or some people might not know the difference or so on. Um, for for uh, private illness reason, I'm fine. I, I, I couldn't properly work the last week or so. I was more in hospitals and so on. But um, so bear with me that I I did not, to my full satisfaction, um, really uh, explore the the relation between my topic of planetarity on the one hand and uh, um, and the topic of of the summer school, which which my initial idea was really to reverse uh, in the direction of a cognitive crisis. Um, um, in, in grasping what it means to live and, and think on a planet or think a planet and the various epistemological injustices um, related to, to the dominant technologies and, and machines uh, that somehow constitute or are the conditions of planetarity. Um, so um, this is not about simply uh, learning uh, in school that, that Earth is a planet or that there are five or ten more or I don't know how, how young you are, unfortunately, we are, we're not here together, that you might have learned in school that there are probably billions of, of, of um, exoplanets. But here we, we're getting closer to a kind of fundamental epistemological challenge um, linked to the question of, of planets and planetarity. My main goal for today is simply, so to say, to make you curious or, or wondering or make you aware that actually we do not and I will repeat that several times, we do not really know what it means to live on a planet. And, and I'm looking forward to the, to the discussion uh, afterwards um, and um, uh, to, to also explore this a bit. Um, and, and also its relation more with the, with the, with the topic of, of, of um, uh, this year's uh, summer school. Um, and without this being an answer on the question of what it means to live on a planet, one can say that this is, has a epistemological reasons and cognitive consequences. We have difficulties thinking the planet, which, le which leads to not just epistemological, but ethical and, and political crisis. Again, we're dealing here with an epistemological crisis um, um, and not just a lack of knowledge, so to say, uh, that probably, I guess, if we would be uh, kind of normal academic or whatever, a uh, uh, seminar situation, um, I would ask you for a definition of a planet, uh, hoping for, for um, education reasons that, that you can't give me one. Um, but so in, in order for, for, for the following to make a bit more sense, uh, um, uh, planets are made of, up of condensed matter, that is like atoms, not atoms, comprising a range of chemical elements and within a mid-range that's important uh, of temperature between cold 
of space and the huge temperature of stars. And thus, plants are able to compose into complex entities from gases to molecules, atoms, subatomic particles, and so on. So a huge variety chemically, physically. Planets are also gravitationally collapsed and differentiated so that they can form dense, approximately uh, spherical bodies with their own gravitational fields, organized internally into different strata and compartments. They also dominate an orbital region uh, around their stars and they interact with each other to produce relatively, relatively stable orbits over very, very long time scales. And very importantly, um, planets are also materially closed. By the way, th these are all like uh, astronomical, astrobiological um, definitions, obviously not, not my inventions. Uh, planets are materially closed, but energetically open, subject uh, to, to flows of energy over long time scales from the parent stars and a hot interior. Um, et cetera, et cetera. There are other elements of, 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 an, of course, ongoing definition. Uh, but um, as, as um, I uh, already indicated and Warren in his, in, in his introduction, this is it's not an astronomical lecture or even um, um, an astrobiological. Astrobiology will be, will be a topic, um, um, but it's, it's, it's of course, uh, related in, uh, uh, um, uh, in, in the humanities. If we speak about astrobiology, um, that uh, very basically is, is that the science seeking to understand the story of life in our universe. The conditions that are necessary for it to emerge and to flourish, its origin, its evolution, and, and both towards the past and, and the future, it's, and the habitability uh, uh, on, on this and on, on other planets. But again, my point today is, is not that we lack astronomical or even uh, astrobiological information or knowledge. Um, this may be too, but my, my point today is that uh, there is a cognitive and epistemological crisis when faced with such a radically new perspective, like uh, um, the apparently quite simple fact of not five or 10, but billions, probably billions of planets um, and, and other findings um, all uh, from the last two or three decades. So basically, we'll be very much in the 21st century. And my tentative thesis with regards to the topic of the summer school will be, um, and I really hope we'll get there time-wise, um, that to exit the current crisis of epistemology, of not understanding what it means to live on a planet, um, that would imply not just to demand cognitive justice, but the reversal of kind of the injustice uh, of all times, of our time, dying too early. Just think of the whole range of, of, of dying, dying too early, starting with the impact of economic and social injustices on life expectancy, um, all the way to the to, to phenomena of, of mass extinction. So I repeat both my initial and my main question, what does it mean to really live on a planet? And since when do we live on a planet? And epistemologically, um, can we even live on a planet without knowing uh, what the planet is and what, what the planetary condition is? Since when, and even more, and this is the justice aspect, for how long do we live on this planet? You will see that these are not, uh, by accident, all temporal questions, time philosophical questions, so to say, related to the temporal dimension of planetarity, but of planets themselves as evolving and deeply historical figures of time, so to say, not, not simply lumps of matter. We all know these images, like how a planet looks since, since a few decades, uh, or like how planet Earth looks, but, but they are misleading in a sense um, that um, yeah, we envision, in, 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 they are all images of, 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 of matter, uh, um, uh, clumps or, or lumps of, of, of matter. And I, um, um, or what Daniel and me are trying is to, to understand them uh, and propose an understanding of planets as, as figures of time. My presentation has like basically two or three parts, depending on how much time we've got. The first and main part of my presentation will be somehow historical, but like, don't worry, not, not, um, um, ancient history, but um, uh, just the last 20 or 30 years, the discourse on planetarity. Uh, the second part, in the second part, I will introduce you to the intervention of, of the relatively new discipline of astrobiology, again, a discipline that exists since 20, 30 years, um, which astonishingly, Warren mentioned it, has had nearly zero impact so far on the increasing 
um, uh, discussions in the humanities or in the art world, for that matter, um, on planetarity. And the third, uh, final part, hopefully we'll get there, um, uh, will address the topic of hyperanticipation and uh, what we call biographical uh, deep history, a deep time and its relation to, to our biographies which somehow result from uh, uh, what will be the focus of the seminar and the book, namely the already mentioned uh, temporal understanding of uh, planets. So I start with part one, the, the, the discourse on, on the discussion on planetarity. Um, uh, the increasing prominence of the concept of planetary in the, in the humanities, one can uh, observe a real boom of considerations about planets in the humanities. They primarily, primarily concern the Earth as a planet, but they also touch on what is generally inherent uh, to and belonging to planets, the planetary, or what is caused by them or is in some way linked to them, planetarity, i.e. the planet as a principle and source of effect. The formats in which the reflections are developed include academic publications and books, there's a new book series on, on planetarities with Goldsmith, as well as conferences, Becoming Planetary as a Challenge, 2022, colloquia, teaching formats, postgraduate programs. Um, I, I guess many of you know uh, Benjamin Bratton's activities, uh, um, uh, the terraforming uh, and uh, anti Kara, uh, and their uh, cultural events, where's the planetary gathering, and so on. And even the idea of a planetary humanities has been brought up or is tried to be more system systematically um, investigated. Conceptualizing planetary humanities is one of them, 2022. One occasion and a focus uh, of the new discourse on planetary is unsurprisingly the radical effects that the presence of intelligent Homo sapiens civilizations is having on planet Earth. The activation of the planetary semantics here owes much to the fact that all the terms and categories of anal analysis, such as the globe, or world, or globality, globalization, with a focus on, on the human um, agency and historical time, um, are increasingly perceived as insufficient to describe an Earth-wide history of the present that includes also non-human actors and materials, agents of a different scale and ontology than humans, and in which the Earth is no longer transforming itself, not only politically and economically, and not even merely ecologically, but really geologically. Um, 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 so if I speak here about a, a, human, a human impact, it's of course a very specific uh, human. Now you know the discussion whether it should be called the Anthropocene or, or the capital is seen um, and so on. But it's, it's so, but the main, the important thing is it's a deep historical uh, temporal dimension. It's a geological uh, impact. And uh, I won't go into details about my, my um, um, difficulties with the concept of, 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 of the Anthropocene, both because th this general um, idea of the, the, the Anthropos uh, um, as, as has been criticized, but also the difficulty um, of, of the exact time scale, the endless discussions, whether it's 200 years old or whether it's 500 years or 2000 years or basically um, even, even longer. So uh, in this respect, the planetarity discourse basically emerges from the same uh, problem horizon um, uh, and by the way, is often carried by the same protagonists as the discussions about the so-called um, Anthropocene. But what is the new discourse on planetarity about? Um, uh, and um, uh, uh, what are planets, uh, how are planets really thought about here? Um, I can, for, for today, I can distinguish two lines of thought, two elements that are important. First, thinking planetarity ref refers to the Earth system a kind of a system theory approach, i.e. to the flow of energy of matter through the planet's biosphere, the atmosphere, hydrosphere, and lithosphere, and their systematic interconnection in biochemical uh, cycles. This is a dimension of the Earth, its basic architecture, which makes it recognizable as an integrated whole system, a whole of interacting components that only today profoundly um, uh, affects uh, human activity. The encounter with the planetarity understood in this way is interpreted by theorists uh, as an encounter with an otherness that crosses the interior space of purely human affairs and histories. 
for historian and post-colonial theorist Deepesh Chakrabarti. Um, uh, 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 for Chakrabarti, the uh, author of the recent key work, The Climate of History in the Planetary Age, which I also uh, recommended um, uh, for, the, for the reader. Um, this is a dimension of being, I quote, the Earth system, or what I have called the planet, that in its protracted cyclicality has a temporally, temporality quite different from human biographies and politics, end of quote. As a product of the Earth's deep history, it links us to a geological time, a very different time, um, as soon as we intervene in it. Quote again, the planetary ultimately is about how some very long-term planetary processes involving both the living and the non-living have provided and keep providing the enabling conditions for both human existence and flourishing, end of quote. And according to Chakrabarti, as soon as we encounter the planetary, we become shockingly aware of it as something very alien and different, a radical otherness, so to say. Quote, this falling into deep history carries with it a certain shock of recognition of the otherness of the planet and its very large-scale spatial and temporal processes of which humans have unintentionally become a part. Faced with the radical otherness of the planet, however, a deeply phenomenological urge on the part of many scientists is to recoil back into the human historical time of the present and address the planet as a matter of profound human concern. End of quote. Otherness is thus primar primarily temporally determined. The inherent temporality of the planet, the geological time, and the temporality of human action and historicity always already diverging in a fundamental way. And of course, that is part uh, is certainly part of a, of a more of a fun fundamental um, epistemological crisis. Thereby, however, the planet at the same time withdraws from the horizon of human categories and valuation, i.e. also marks an ethical, political outside. Interestingly, the, this motive of radical otherness accompanies the recent discourse of the planetary from its very beginning, I would say. Thus, in the early 2000s already, uh, the literary scholar Gaeta Spivak, whom I assume all of you are familiar with, is the kind of the doyen of, of post-colonial theory, Spivak wrote already in the early 2000s, uh, or in the late 90s, the planet is in the species of alterity belonging to another system, and yet we inhabit it on loan. I quote, the globe is, it's part of our polemics against the globalization, the globe is on our computers, no one lives there. It allows us to think that we can begin to control it. The planet, however, on the other side, uh, is in the species of alterity belonging to another system, and yet we inhabit it, as I already said, on loan. End of quote. Spivak thus suggests a difference between the globe as a cartographic um, representation, capitalist uh, uh, cartography, which seemingly uninhabited by humans and other living beings, conceives of the earth as a colonial, imperial, and basically capitalist space that can be dominated at will. And on the other hand, the planet as an object that is not represented, but really and truly inhabited even if only unknown, and therefore is also more strongly evading uh, fantasies of control. However, what concerns us here, what I'm interested in, is the radical otherness and separation of the planet and humanity or living entity, entities, which is generally considered as, as a given, which I find very problematic, um, um, or uh, as, it is, uh, as problematic as it is dominant within planetary thinking these days. The planet, the planet doesn't give a damn, Chakrabarti put somewhere. In the context of uh, the philosopher and design theorist Benjamin Breton in his research programs, um, the, the philosopher Lucas uh, Likatsan wrote a short introduction to, to uh, comparative planetology. That, that's a term that's also discussed in, in astrobiology. Um, and in which the otherness of, of the planet has a pilot uh, of a position that aims at the decentering and decentralization of your homo sapiens civilizations living in it. Basically, I quote, Earth is an impersonal geophysical process in which humans play the role of temporary mediators, end of quote. Living beings, animals, plants, bacteria, cells, and of course homo sapiens, therefore only temporary mediators. But 
And uh, it, it is for this question I want to somehow raise an awareness. Hello? All good? Um, I can, I can, I can, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm working here and I'm, I've been all day in meetings with, uh, uh, and there was not a, there was not a problem. I, I, I mean, I can go basically and sit on the floor, uh, one meter away from, from the, uh, from the Wi-Fi. Is it better now? Is it okay? No, it's fine. Um, I mean... Can you hear me better now? Okay. Um, so the, the question I want to um, um, raise your awareness for, in what sense uh, does it make to view the planet philosoph is, is what sense does it actually make to view the planet uh, philosophically through the lens of it being unpopulated by humans in a situation of just us uh, uh, humans being 8 billion or soon 10 billion living, living beings uh, um, um, uh, present on it. And not just present on it, but uh, as astrobiological and other research is showing, a planet that only developed, that only became the way it, it, it is and only developed the way it did in parallel with various, not just human life forms, over the last hundreds of millions and billions of years, what what um, can be called a co-evolutionary development, a co-evolution of planet and life, um, which we haven't really grasped yet uh, philosophically and uh, epistemologically. So instead of this radical otherness that completely separates life um, and and planet, um, uh, yeah, the, the the counter suggestion, which regards to both a natural philosophy and a critical epistemology of time. What I'm interested in is to go beyond the attribution of only a geological time of the planet, as Chakrabarti puts it, uh, as if the only temporality that belongs to the planet itself is the infinitely slow and geological one, because that the Earth system should be immune to ethical or political valuations and categories hardly makes sense when humans are implicated in its deformation, global warming, or think of land use patterns, extractivism, and other things, in obscenely unequal ways. And I think this is a major dimension of, of social injustice um, um, that uh, extremely unequally affected by its costs or negative consequences. All this possibly becomes even more problematic against the background of, of the observation that it is nothing else than this Earth system which finally has produced the humans who now deform it. In what valid sense then could it be ontologically alien to them? Sorry for all these questions or many questions, but I want to finish this, this, this um, uh, first line of thought. Um, uh, uh, of this course about planet, uh, planetarity um, uh, with, with yet another question. On the Earth, like planets, the very place in the universe, and perhaps the only ones that are just about ready for the intervention of uh, intelligent civilizations that produce them. So to what extent do we need intelligence, life, and planetarity together? Which brings me to the second line of, of, of this course uh, in the new thinking of the, planet, of the planetary, which runs along the question. The first one was the, uh, the Earth system, and the second one runs along the question of how we can perceive the Earth as a planet at all, and how its perception could or should guide our actions on it, and with reference to it collectively and individually. The question of perception is not exhausted in the astronomical knowledge of the Earth as a celestial body in the solar system and the Milky Way or a vague awareness of anthropocenic impact on nature, whatever that is. Uh, and as if, as if humans or so, or even capitalism for that matter, or technology would not be um, part of nature by now. Rather, it is a matter of making the Earth system in its components, climate system, biochemical cycles, biodiversity, etc., 
actually perceptible and understandable, including formations of an empirically or quantitatively grounded concept of the planet as a system, depends uh, on the existence of planetary infrastructures and apparatuses of knowledges, what Benjamin Bratton calls planetary scale computation. The planet Earth being covered by a network of sensors such as weather stations, satellites, statistical offices, etc., whose huge amounts of data are fed into elaborate computer models of the climate Earth system. And of course, um, uh, these uh, systems are, are very unequally um, distributed. Um, 